Okay, so as I said, good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you for taking the time to be here for today's stroke webinar. My name is Cassandra, and this morning I'll be talking about making the most of your upper limb after stroke. Now, if you're joining me here today, either yourself or someone you care for has experienced a stroke. Now, whether that stroke was recent, whether it was months ago, or even whether it was years ago, the information that I'm going to give you today should be relevant to you all. And I hope that each of you can take something with you that is new or meaningful, or that you can apply in some way in your recovery going ahead. To give a brief overview of what we'll cover today and some of the key messages that we're going to look at. Um, we'll go first through what post-stroke upper limb therapy should look like. We'll look at why we use goal-based therapy to improve your participation in life. And finally, we'll look at how much practice you need to make the most of your arm and why. Now, before we do that, um, we'll talk just briefly at the role of physiotherapy and occupational therapy post-stroke. Both disciplines can provide upper limb therapy, so you might be working with only one of the two, you might be working with both. And these are some of the main jobs that we have as therapists when it comes to helping to manage your upper limb. So first, it's our job to assess your arm function and your ability to complete everyday activities. So for example, your ability to get dressed, have a drink, use a knife and a fork, brush your hair and so on. It's also our job to help you identify meaningful goals to work towards in your therapy. So whether that's being able to use cutlery to eat, whether it's to learn how to type again, because that's relevant for your work. From there, it's our job to help implement different therapy interventions, including a home exercise program to help you reach these goals. And we'll go through some of the different therapy interventions shortly. It's also our job to assess the need for and prescribe adaptive equipment or assistive devices. So post-stroke upper limb therapy, what should it look like? Therapy should of course always start with an assessment. The first time each of you saw a therapist, they would have begun with an assessment. This often starts with taking a history and talking about your background, the different functional problems you might be having and what goals you have. So what are you hoping to achieve out of your physiotherapy or occupational therapy? Therapists will then complete a functional assessment based on the tasks that you're having problems with and as well as your goals. So for example, if you're having trouble reaching forward to pick up an object, the therapist should look at you trying to complete that task. And then from there, they might complete a more in-depth physical assessment to identify why those problems might actually be occurring. So for example, is there weakness in any of the muscles that you need at your shoulder, your elbow, your wrist or your fingers? that are required to reach forward to pick up an object? Is there any stiffness in any of those muscles that's preventing you from reaching forward or opening your hand? Or is it maybe due to a lack of coordination? There's many reasons why um, people can struggle with different tasks and we'll go into some more of them in just a moment. As part of an assessment, therapists will also complete outcome measures. So some of you might be familiar with that photo on the right. That's the box and block test, which is a common one that we use in therapy. And the role of outcome measures is they give us a score based on a person's upper limb function that we can complete the first time we see a client. And then we can repeat down the track as well in order to monitor whether the therapy we're providing is effective and it's actually improving your arm function. Questionnaires can also be completed along a similar vein um, where we'll get clients to fill out a questionnaire on how well or how much they're using their upper limb in their daily activities, complete it 
um, in the first time that we see clients and then repeating it intermittently throughout their therapy interventions to track progress. So what are some of the common problems post-stroke? Uh, this is by no means an exhaustive list, um, but if you're here today, it's likely that one or more of these is relevant to you. Many people will have issues with weakness and that can range from quite mild weakness to complete paralysis of their arm. People can also experience a loss of coordination. You might have heard of the word ataxia, which describes movements that are clumsy or poorly controlled. People can also experience a loss of sensation or a reduction in sensation. For example, a person might be able to pick up an object, but find that when they turn their head or turn their attention away from what they're holding, they might be likely to drop it because they don't have that information being sent to their brain about the position, the weight, the feel, the pressure of the object in their hand. Spasticity is another problem that a lot of people can have after a stroke. And spasticity we define as an involuntary, uncontrolled contraction of a muscle in response to being stretched. So for example, a person might go to very quickly reach their arm forward so their elbow straightens. The bicep muscle, if there's spasticity in that muscle, can sometimes contract, which bends our elbow in response to being stretched as the arm reaches forward. So what we often see is a jerkiness to people's movements or an inability to reach forward smoothly, especially when a person tries to move quickly. Finally, people can also have stiffness. Um, and this is stiffness in muscles, though it can of course occur in joints as well. So it's quite common after a stroke that a person's fingers curl over into a resting position that's almost like a fist. And it can be very difficult for that person to open their hand. That doesn't always mean that a person has spasticity, but there might be tightness in some of these muscles in the palm of the hand and in the fingers that are pulling the hand into this closed position. And if they're very weak, it can be very difficult to overcome that stiffness and straighten your hand, straighten your fingers. So with some of these common problems in mind, what do we actually do about some of them? We're very fortunate as physios and occupational therapists who are working with stroke patients that we have a beautiful set of clinical guidelines that tells us what different types of therapies are effective after a stroke based on all the best and most recent um, research that's out there. This version was published in 2017, but one of the great things about this set of guidelines, and this is an Australian set of guidelines, is that they're what we call a living guideline, which means that the online version gets updated as new evidence comes out. So it's a rolling living guideline, which is great for us to have. In these guidelines, um, there are some different therapy options that are in our toolbox to help clients regain some of their upper limb function. We'll go through most of these now, what they are, who might benefit from them, and what some of those benefits might be. Functional task practice is the first one, and I've bolded it because there is the strongest evidence behind this intervention for improving arm function. So what is functional task practice? Functional task practice is practice that is specific to a given task. For example, picking up a cup, pinching a peg, using a knife and fork, cutlery to cup, cut up your food. This approach is based on the very, very simple idea that in order to improve a person's ability to perform a task, they need to practice that task. If a person wants to learn to play the guitar, they need to practice playing the guitar. When we're kids and we wanna learn how to write, we need to practice writing. 
So our exercise that we do and the practice that we do needs to be task specific. I've just got the uh, quality of this photo isn't, oh sorry, the video isn't as good as it could be, but we just have a very quick video here of one of the clients using a knife and fork um, to cut up um, the dough on his plate that we're using at the moment. You can see as well, he's got electrical stimulation on his arm, which is helping him to pronate, which is turn your hand over, which is the movement that we need in order to cut up food. We don't do it with our palm facing up. We do it with our palm facing down, which involves rotating our forearm. So you can often combine therapies as well. We'll speak about electrical stimulation a little more in just a moment, but these different therapy options often aren't presented individually. Often we're combining them to find the most effective way um, to complete a given task. So really the majority of therapy for a lot of people should comprise a functional task practice, particularly if that's, that's a person who has a fair amount of movement already. If the whole task is too difficult for someone, then what we do is we break it down into what's called part practice, where only a particular movement or particular part of the task is practice. So for example, if we think about reaching forward to pick up a cup, what we need to accomplish in that at the hand is extending at the wrist and opening up of the fingers to be able to grasp the cup. So we need the wrist working and we also need the fingers and the thumb working. So if we look just quickly to the video on the left, you can see this client here is only working on opening up and straightening her fingers. And this client would do hundreds and hundreds of repetitions of this as part of her exercise program. You can see with her other hand, she's stabilizing the wrist, so that's not moving. She's only focusing on the fingers. So this is what we call part practice, but it's really important when we're doing part practice that we're keeping the overall task or the overall goal in mind. Just lifting your fingers for hundreds of repetitions can sometimes feel a little bit meaningless and we're quite aware of that as therapists so making sure that it's really clear why you're doing that particular movement to be able to open your fingers to grasp a cup or any object is really important in this video on the right you can see that she's really just focusing on the wrist movement now so trying to bend her wrist backwards which is what we need to be able to grasp a cup so just working on that part of the movement. Often once we do enough part practice, we can then reincorporate it into the whole task for that full functional task practice. So moving on now to mirror therapy. This is another therapy that is available um, for us to utilize as therapists and is available to you guys as well. Some people may have seen this before, perhaps some people haven't. So what does it involve? Mirror therapy, as you can see in this photo of this particular client on the right, involves placing a mirror between the arms so that the image of a moving non-affected limb gives the illusion of normal movement in the stroke affected limb. So for this particular client, he's got his affected limb, the right hand inside the mirror box and his non-affected, his left hand outside. And you can see him looking into the mirror and that gives the impression that the right hand is moving as the left hand does. So this particular patient was working on getting back to typing. So he was practicing just with his index finger, lifting it off the table and then popping it back on. 
lifting it off, popping it back on. He was doing both sides in time at the same time. So it's important that if, pay, if people have movement, that they're attempting the movement with the hand that is inside the mirror box. It's almost like it's tricking the brain a little bit in terms of looking into the mirror, tricking the brain to think that that hand is working. And what we know from the research and research that's looked at this therapy and has also imaged the brain at the same time is that the side of the brain that has been affected also lights up when the person is moving their non-affected side and looking in the mirror. So we're still getting some activation and stimulation on the affected side of the brain when people are completing mirror therapy. In terms of who might benefit from mirror therapy, people with severe weakness or paralysis in their arm. So if you're someone who has fairly good strength, um, maybe only has very mild coordination issues, you might not be someone who this would be the first port of call for. You would be mostly doing functional task practice. But if you're someone who has very severe weakness in your hand, even to the point of paralysis, then this um, can be a very good option for you. What are some of the benefits? So improving motor function and impairment. When we think of impairments, we're thinking of the underlying problems uh, that are causing issues with the movement. So is it strength, coordination, sensation, and so on? So the main ones that people will find improved with this is their strength. Um, and also there's research that's shown um, that mirror therapy, in, mirror therapy, excuse me, improves use of people's arms in their daily activities. Next off, another um, therapy in our toolbox is constraint induced movement therapy, um, which is you might hear shortened to CIMT as well. So what is it? CIMT, it's probably one of the most intense therapy options that we have for people. So it involves three main components, intensive practice using the weaker arm, constraint use of the weak arm by placing the non-affected arm in a mid. So as you can see in the photo, this person has their non-affected left side in the mitt, which means that they're only using their affected right side for all of these different exercise or functional tasks. That's one of the most important parts of this constraint-induced movement therapy um, is making sure that you're getting as much practice as possible with the affected side and not using the unaffected side to compensate or help with a given task. The third component of a CIMT block or therapy is what we call a transfer package. And this is basically something that your therapist will put together that supports the use of the new skills that you're learning and developing in therapy into real life situations at home. So generally the transfer package, they'll generally give it to you as a set of um, paper. Um, well, it'll involve filling out a home exercise diary. So the exercises that you and your therapist agree upon to do at home, you've got somewhere to log those and bring them back to your therapist. It'll also involve implementing different homework skills. So not necessarily the exercises that make part of your or that are part of your home exercise program, but different additional things to do around the house. So for example, using your affected side to turn the light switch off, using the affected side to you know, pick up your mobile phone when you need to use that. So things that are challenging, but achievable with the affected side, there'll be a list of these that are very relevant to you know, things you can do in your everyday life that'll form part of that transfer package. 
Part of that transfer package will also involve filling out a motor activity log every day. The motor activity log is just a, a questionnaire that has a list of different tasks like turning light switch off, using your phone, whatever it might be, and rating on a scale of zero to five, how much you're using your affected arm to do that activity and how well you're using your affected arm to do that activity. And then from the start to the end of therapy and during as well, we can track your scores on that motor activity log to see whether you're improving. As you can see, usually the program is a two week program. Minimally, it can be longer and it involves therapy three to four hours a day. So that might in an outpatient setting, if you're in the community, that might involve one hour of structured therapy a day with the therapist, plus two to three hours a day at home of independent practice, or if you have the support of family or support workers available to you, then utilizing those supports. So it is intensive. And for that reason, it isn't necessarily a therapy option that will be useful or available to everyone. But for those that can manage that degree of therapy intensity and frequency given fatigue levels and all of the other things that can impact a person's participation in therapy, then it is a really great option for a lot of people. So who might benefit from this? Really the program to be eligible for a CIMT program, a person needs to have some movement in their hand and in their shoulder. So clinicians and therapists will do what's called a flannel test. Um, you can just use a, we generally just use a tea towel for it. But what we ask our clients to do is to pick up a tea towel off the table using whatever grip or grasp is available to them, lifting it up off the table and then releasing to drop it. So they need some degree of movement in their shoulder and some degree of movement in their hand as well to be able to get the most out of this particular therapy program. What are the benefits? There's lots of benefits of CIMT. But overall, the research shows us that people who engage in this intensive program will be able to improve their upper limb use, um, and particularly in terms of their dexterity as well, so including their ability to grasp, grip, and pinch, okay? So those more fine motor control skills. Another, another tool tool in our toolbox um, of therapy interventions is electrical stimulation. And this basically involves using an electrical current to stimulate muscles and move your arm. So you can see this client here is set up with the electrodes close to his elbow and they're positioned over the muscles that extend or bend a person's wrist back in this direction. As I said earlier, being able to bend your wrist like this is really important to be able to grasp an object. So that's what this particular client was working on as part of his functional task practice. So reaching forward, using the electrical stimulation to help him bend his wrist back as he took hold of the cup. So combining therapies, as I explained earlier. Who might benefit from electrical stimulation? Really anyone with weakness, but generally it's used on people with very severe weakness, including those that are unable to contract their muscles at all to produce movement. So if you're someone who does have a complete paralysis in your arm, then this can be a good option. Why do we use it or what are some of the benefits? Building strength to allow increased practice of movement. So as we all know, and we'll go into how much practice we need and why we need it a little bit later on, but we know that we do need a lot of practice. Some people due to their weakness or due to fatigue 
might not be able to get those large repetitions really that we need in stroke recovery. So what the electrical stimulation can do is assist with that and increase the repetitions that a person is completing. Electrical stimulation is also a good option for improving pain. There's evidence in particularly for people who have very severe weakness um, in their shoulder um, to the point that it can be quite painful for them. Uh, there is evidence that shows that using electrical stimulation on the muscles that support the shoulder joint can help people to manage their pain. In those particular studies, people were using the electrical stimulation for up to six hours a day. Um, so it is quite a lot of time um, in these particular studies using the electrical stimulation, but there is evidence that it can help to manage people's pain, particularly at the shoulder. And finally, we also use electrical stimulation to improve use of upper limit activities. And that's particularly relevant when it's combined with functional task practice as well. The last one that we'll look at um, is mental practice, which you might hear referred to as mental Im imagery as well. And what this involves is imagining yourself performing a skilled movement without doing it and then trying to complete the movement. So people, the particular video that I've got here, unfortunately, I didn't have any relevant footage of an upper limb client doing this, but you can see here for this particular client who has weakness on both sides, his left side is a lot weaker than his right side. You can see in the first video on the left, I've got him doing what we call ankle dorsiflexion. So lifting up his foot on the right side, his stronger side, five times. And you can see he's got reasonable movement there. He then closes his eyes and has a go visualizing and then trying to complete it on the left. You can see there, he isn't really getting the same movement that he's getting on the right-hand side. And he does try and compensate with other muscles to try and make that movement occur. So if we just watch that again, he finishes this particular movement on the right-hand side, has a go, closing his eyes, visualizing a perfect movement on the left-hand side, and then has a go, but he's moving his knee a lot. He's moving his hip because he can't activate the right muscles on the left-hand side at the ankle to lift his foot up. This client then went away and did five days of mental practice where he did it three to five times a day for five to 10 minutes. His practice did vary day to day, but in the particular time that I was seeing this client, this was his only homework task. So this was the big focus between two sessions. And you can see in the video on the right, let me just see if we're getting up. Yeah, beautiful. So we're going to go through the same process. So going right and left, right and left. And you can see in the video, he's getting a lot better lift on that left-hand side than he was even just a few days prior. So there is a lot of benefit from, or there can be a lot of benefit from mental practice, though it is more beneficial for people who have some degree of movement, even if it's only very minor movement. Um, this isn't necessarily something that we would use with people who have complete paralysis. Um, of their hand, but for people who have some degree of movement, even if it's just very, very minor, this can be a good option as well. So what are some of the benefits? So there's evidence out there that shows that mental practice improves strength and can improve overall arm function as well. So moving on now to why we use goal-based therapy to improve your participation in life. 
So goal-based therapy, first off, we'll talk about what it is. Um, very simply, goal-based therapy is therapy that is driven towards the things that you want to achieve. Without exception, really, the best therapy is always therapy that has a direction and a specific goal in mind. So each exercise that your therapist prescribes you should be geared towards a particular movement or a particular activity that is meaningful to you. In the absence of goals, therapy can become sometimes quite general, um, which isn't really an effective way to go about improving a person's function. Setting goals can also break down or break things down into more manageable chunks. A lot of people, particularly at the start of their therapy journey, their recovery journey, um, can often come in with the goal of getting better or I want to be back to the way that I was, um, which they're goals that are, while being great, they're very broad, they're very long-term, and they don't provide much direction for what you would specifically like to achieve in therapy. So making smaller goals, smaller activity-based goals, such as being able to take a drink from a coffee mug, for example, allows us to break down those really large long-term goals into something that's achievable and measurable. Goal setting should also occur in collaboration with your therapist. So you'll, in your initial assessment, as well as at any time during the therapy pro progress or process rather, um, you let us know what tasks you want to work on. And then it's our job as physios and occupational therapists to break down what you actually need to be able to do to achieve that larger goal. Goals, of course, can also increase motivation and engagement. And if you're clearly working towards something that you can use in your everyday life, people are much more likely to engage in the high amounts of practice, more likely to engage in their home exercise programs. And of course, that added practice is really vital to seeing the full benefits that therapy can have for someone. So some tips for goal setting. The first off at the top, write them down or get someone to write them down for you. Um, your therapist certainly will write them down in their notes, but if possible, have your own copy as well to take home with you. Writing things down and have a visual representation of something helps us to keep something sort of at the forefront of our mind. And there is always something, at least I find for myself, powerful and motivating about putting your thoughts or intentions into writing. Next tip would be to set three to four goals at a time. I think having more if people, you know, often people have a lot of different things that they want to achieve. They might have, you know, six, seven, eight goals in mind that they want to be working towards. But having more than sort of three to four can often spread yourself, be spreading yourself a little bit too thin and spreading the potential benefits a little bit too far um, in your therapy. So, of course, there's only so many hours in the day for you to be completing exercises. So to ensure that you can get the most benefits out of your rehabilitation and your therapy, it's a good idea to stick to this number of goals at any one time. Another tip would be to track your progress. So whether that's using an exercise diary to keep track of your progress day to day or week to week as you work towards your goal. Um, sometimes therapists might print you out a timetable where you can just write down and log the amount of practice that you're doing. Um, I often find that for a lot of patients, tracking their progress generally stimulates a little bit more practice as well. So I think that's a very good option for the vast majority of people. Next tip is to discuss your goals as well. So obviously you'll discuss them with your therapist, but discuss them if, you, if you're comfortable to and happy to, discuss them with your family, discuss them with your friends, someone that you can trust that can help to keep you accountable and can act as a little bit of a, a motivator as well. 
when it comes to goal setting, um, we also want to make sure that there are short term goals as well as those larger long term goals. So there should always be both. Um, often people, particularly early days after a stroke, they're very good at seeing the long term goals. And as therapists, if um, clients aren't able to come up with goals that are achievable in the short term, then that's where we'll come in um, to really break down those long term goals into shorter term goals that will be achievable in six weeks, 12 weeks, three months, six months and so on. So basically, it's our job to come up with those necessary stepping stones to that long term goal. And finally, the last tip is setting SMART goals. And, and this is our job as a therapist as well, to help put these goals into something that resembles a SMART goal. So we'll go quickly over what a SMART goal is. So SMART is an acronym where the S stands for specific. So a specific goal just means a well-defined goal. So for example, I would like to be able to do up the buttons on my shirt independently would be an example of a specific goal. The goal should also be measurable. So is there a clear criteria of what it means to achieve that goal or not achieve that goal? In the example of doing buttons up on a shirt, there is a clear, I guess, success or lack of success, whether the person, whether the person can or can't do that task. But you can also make it even more specific in terms of potentially adding in a time. So say a person would like to be able to do the buttons up in their shirt in under two minutes. So that's an additional way to see whether a person um, can or can't do that task in a measurable way. The A in SMART stands for attainable or achievable. So we want to aim high with these goals but it's also important that the goals are realistic. And it can often be quite difficult for clients to be able to, I guess, foresee their progress and we wouldn't expect clients to. So that's where our expertise as therapists come in as well to be able to say, yes, this is an achievable goal in four weeks or maybe it's an achievable goal in three months, six months and putting an attainable time frame on it. So the R in SMART stands for relevant. So the goal should be relevant to you and meaningful to you in your life. And finally, which I mentioned before, T is time frame. So set a time frame for the goal. So for example, that could be something that's achievable in 12 weeks, 18 weeks, six months, a year, whatever it might be. Having a time frame on the goal, um, almost like, a work deadline or whatever it might be, if there's a specific time frame on it, people are often much more likely to put in the work to achieve it because there's a, a set time frame um, that you and your therapist would have agreed upon to achieve that goal. So the final part of the presentation is how much practice you need to make the most of your arm and why. So a lot of you would gen like know a general answer to this. Um, and a rough answer would be, well, lots, right? We know we need lots of practice. And you're absolutely right. Um, but to really appreciate why this is the case, we need to understand this term, neuroplasticity. And it's probably a term that a lot of you might have heard before. Um, but we'll dive in a little bit deeper to see what neuroplasticity plasticity actually means. First, let's talk about how the brain works. So the brain is made up of neurons or nerve cells, more than 100 billion of them. And these are essentially the building blocks of the brain and the nervous system. So that includes our spinal cord. And what these neurons do is that they send electrical signals between different parts of the brain and also down our spinal cord to the different parts of our bodies. Signals that tell us to move, tell us to speak, tell us to move our hand to pick up our copy mug off the table. When a stroke occurs, the neurons in the affected part of the brain die. 
whether that's from being deprived of oxygen, if you're someone who's had a clot in their brain, or perhaps a bleed in the brain as well can also lead to that lack of oxygen. Rehabilitation and therapy isn't about fixing those affected neurons. It's about this, neuroplasticity, which essentially is the ability of the brain to form new connections, to rewire, remodel, and change in response to experience. And experience in this context um, is probably synonymous with practice. So to change in response to practice. Neuroplasticity, when I first learned about it, it was, I was, I guess, fairly mind blown by it. And it was one of the reasons that I wanted to be a physiotherapist in the first place, because it was such a novel idea to me at the time that after a stroke, the brain was capable of moving a particular function from a damaged area of the brain to another undamaged area of the brain. And this particular type of neuroplasticity we refer to as functional neuroplasticity. So the brain changing what part of it is responsible for a given movement. So not so much fixing the neurons, but creating new connections to make movement possible. I suppose it's like, you know, learning the piano, the more we play, the more neural pathways will develop in that particular part of the brain um, that are responsible for moving our fingers quickly, for those dexterous movements that you need to play the piano. Okay, so how much practice do we actually need? I wish I had a perfect <laughs> exact answer for this. Um, but unfortunately, at this stage, research doesn't tell us exactly how much practice a person needs to recover their function. What research does tell us, though, is that by and large, the more practice a person can do, the better. So there was a really nice research study that was done in 2012 that demonstrated this. And this particular study they aim to investigate the effects of different amounts of arm rehabilitation training on the functional recovery of that weak limb. So I think there were 32 participants all together and they got separated into three different groups. Group A received one hour of therapy a day. Group B received two hours of therapy a day and group C received three hours of therapy a day. They receive this therapy five days a week for six weeks altogether. And these were the results. Well, actually the good news about this particular study is that all groups actually had a significant improvement in their arm function. So the particular things that they looked at was strength, coordination and overall function and use of the arm in daily activities. So all the three groups improved, which is great. But most importantly, this study showed that group C improved significantly more than group A did. And we can infer from that that the more therapy a person does, the better outcomes they'll have. So what are some of the principles of neuroplastic rehabilitation that we should be thinking about and incorporating into your therapy? The first one, which I'm sure a lot of you all have heard of, is use it or lose it. In essence, if we don't engage in certain activities, those neural pathways responsible for that activity will deteriorate and die off. So to keep the piano analogy going, if we stop playing the piano, those skills will eventually deteriorate. In practice, what that means is that you need to use your arm as much as you can, including outside of your therapy time. That brings me to the second principle, which is essentially the opposite, use it and improve it. So if you engage in activities that utilize the movements you want to get back, your brain has a better chance of rebuilding those neural pathways necessary for those movements. So think about what you do outside of your therapy time. Maybe you can't wash up with your affected hand, but can you stabilize a pan or a dish in the sink with your affected arm 
while your non-affected arm does the harder parts of the washing up. Can you turn a light switch off? Could you try and use that arm to help you fold clothes or fold laundry? I think the key part of this is really just having a go to start off with. Um, a lot of people with strokes end up with what we call learned disuse or non-use, which is over time, particularly for people who might spend time in a sling or a shoulder support, which restricts movement, it's an additional barrier, I suppose, where the neural pathways will continue to deteriorate because we're not getting any practice. Um, so if you are someone that uses a sling or uses a, a shoulder support, maybe bring it up next time with your therapist and see maybe whether they can reassess you um, to spend a little bit more time out of it outside of therapy, particularly if you're someone who doesn't struggle with pain in your shoulder. The third principle of neuroplastic rehabilitation is repetition and intensity. So, oh, excuse me, specificity of training, I skipped ahead. Um, so we've touched on this before in terms of the functional task practice, um, but essentially what, that, what this means is that all the training that we provide should be specific to a given task. So if your goal is to write, you need to practice picking up a pen and then writing with that pen. And the more specific the training is, the better you'll be able to generate stronger and more specific neural pathways in the brain for that particular task. The fourth one is repetition and intensity. So the more you can do by and large, the better. And this repetition, as I've said a few times, counts for outside of therapy as well. If you're someone listening today who cares for someone, um, or provide support for someone who's had a stroke, ask yourself, is there anything that I currently do um, for this person who's had a stroke that they could potentially do for themselves or could do perhaps part of it for themselves with support? And if the answer is maybe yes for a couple of different tasks, have a go at it together um, to see if you can increase that repetition outside of therapy times. The fifth principle is time matters. Uh, so in short, our brains are more likely to make greater changes, neuroplastic changes in the acute stage um, after a stroke um, than in the chronic stages. Um, and there's research out there um, that shows that early intervention after a stroke really is paramount in people's recovery. Um, but that doesn't at all mean that people in the chronic stages after stroke um, can't make changes as well because absolutely they can. Um, generally, those changes are a little more difficult to make and can come a little bit more slowly, but they're certainly still possible even years down the track. And the last principle um, that I want to speak about is salience matters. So salience is how important or meaningful or worthy a task is to you. And to get the most out of rehab, the task does need to be important to you. And that's where setting goals, setting good goals comes into this. So how do we increase practice? As I said, make meaningful goals, log your practice. So this could be using an exercise diary, printing off a table of your week, which you can do yourself and just you know, write down the exercises and tick them off or log how many repetitions you've done. Recruit the help of family or support workers if they're available to you. Um, obviously, they can act as a bit of a support system, um, a bit of encouragement or accountability. Um, wherever possible, though, therapists should endeavour to set up exercises that you can complete without any physical assistance um, to, so that you're not reliant on anyone else to get your exercises done. Um, and, of course, using your arm outside of therapy. So in terms of take-home messages for day, practice, practice, practice. Use your arm as much as possible in your everyday activities. Let your therapist know what your goals are. And the last one, um, be kind and be patient with yourself, um, which I understand is perhaps easier, easier said than done. I know that people often use the phrase sort of road to recovery um, after stroke and that inherently implies, I suppose, that recovery is a destination or a set endpoint um, rather than a journey, and it very much is a journey. Um, 
it's one that can be quite slow for some people and and can be very difficult and I have so much admiration for for my clients who keep moving uh, and keep working and keep turning up to their therapy day after day and week after week because they still have things that they want to achieve even years down the road. The final thing that I want to leave you with today um, is analogy, an analogy that I found useful in my own personal life at times um, when I've been trying to build a new habit or develop a new way of thinking. And I think it applies really, really nicely to the idea of neuroplasticity and stroke recovery. And I'm a bit of a visual learner myself. So if that's you as well, then this might strike a chord with you. Um, I want you to imagine a pathway through the forest like this one here. And that pathway is a neural pathway. One of the many neural pathways in your brain that's responsible for moving your arm and moving your hand. Imagine a stroke as a landslide through that pathway. Not fixable, granted, but divertible. As therapists, it's our job to give you the right tools to carve yourself a new neural pathway. Now, this new neural pathway, unfortunately, it's uphill. It's very, very overgrown. There's a lot of dense underbrush. It's rocky and it's, it's uneven. The first time you tread it, it might feel like climbing Mount Everest. But the great thing about these neural pathways is the more you use them, the more we improve them. So each time you walk that pathway, you clear a little bit more of the underbrush, get rid of the overgrown branches, and that pathway becomes easier and easier and easier to access. Movement becomes easier and easier and easier to access. Like I said, if you're a visual learner like me, this is something that I've found really useful in the past, um, but I hope, I hope that's something that can be relevant relevant to you as a, an easy way to visualize how neuroplasticity can actually occur in the brain. So thank you for watching and thank you for taking the time this morning uh, to hopefully learn, learn a little bit about how to make the most of your upper limb after stroke. If you do have any questions, um, feel free to pop them in the chat. We do have five to 10 minutes now. So if there is anything you would like to ask, then please um, jump into the uh, chat and I'll have a quick look at them now to see. Okay, so there's one that's already popped up in the chat. Can we use the electrical stimulation with a client who has a pacemaker on the side of the affected limb? So this is something that you would want to get clearance from their cardiologist for. So you would never use electrical stimulation over the site of the pacemaker, but it isn't a complete contraindication we call them so it's not a, a set in stone rule that you can't use them on that side but it is something that we as therapists would need to liaise with your cardiologist uh, to get get their medical clearance to be able to do electrical stimulation on that side Okay, so we've got another question coming in from Arthur. Thank you, Arthur. Is there any research paper suggesting what therapy option is appropriate or inappropriate for chronic and acute stages, months or years post stroke? Um, so very broad question. So the, I guess when we look at evidence, there's levels of evidence um, in terms of their strengths. So in terms of the clinical guideline that I looked at and spoke briefly about before, that's our best evidence out there. So clinical practice guidelines is basically takes all the wonderful information we get from individual research and control trials and basically puts it into a nice summary in a set of practice guidelines. So the um, particular recommendations that are put forth in the stroke guidelines are not particular to whether someone is in the acute stage, subacute or chronic stage after a stroke. Um, what I would say is if you're in um, the acute stage of, of a stroke and really the chronic as well, 
you want to be, I suppose, utilizing as many of the relevant therapies that are available to you. So if functional task practice, if you're someone who, who can engage in that, then you beauty that should form the bulk of your therapy. But all of these other types like your mirror therapy, electrical stimulation, mental practice, our, the evidence shows us that they're great adjuncts to that functional task practice. And like I said, that's irrespective of the stage that someone is post-stroke. So if you're someone who's five years down the track but hasn't at all um, done any mirror therapy, then by all means, I would encourage you to bring it up with your therapist um, and have a go at it because even down the track, um, people can show those improvements. Okay. Thank you, Phil. All right, so if there's any other questions, we've got three minutes left, pop them in. Um, but if there isn't, thank you so much, um, everyone who has attended today. I hope you've gotten um, something out of today and learnt something. Um, and that you can go forward a little bit more knowledgeable about your um, upper limb rehabilitation. Okay, it looks like those are all of the questions, um, but by all means, if you have um, any other questions that pop, it, pop up in the future, um, particularly if you're not someone who um, we see in the clinic here at ARC, then by all means, um, you can email our office or give them a call and they can give you my um, email and I'm more than happy to answer any questions um, via email as well, or even on the phone if you have them. Okay, all right. Thank you everyone um, and have a good afternoon.